In my absence, the elder and the deacons have been progressing with our understanding of the book of Acts. They've been taking you on a journey uh, for you to grow in your knowledge of God. And through that knowledge of God to help your relationship with God. And so we're thankful for that, for that journey that's been going on in the last two months. And today I will continue in that journey. For, and for that purpose, we go to Acts chapter 11 and we read from verse 1 to verse 18. So let us do that right now. Acts chapter 11 and we read from verse 1 to verse 18. Okay, let's read. Now the apostles and the brethren who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. And when Peter came up to Jerusalem, those who were circumcised took issue with him, saying, You went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. But Peter began speaking and proceeded to explain to them in orderly sequence, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision, an object coming down like a great sheet lowered by four corners from the sky, and it came, and it came right down to me. And when I had fixed my gaze on it and was observing it, I saw the four-footed animals of the earth and the wild beasts and the crawling creatures and the birds of the air. I also heard a voice saying to me, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, by no means, Lord, for nothing unholy or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a voice from heaven answered a second time, what God has cleansed no longer consider unholy. This happened three times, and everything was drawn up back into the sky. And behold, at that moment, three men appeared at the house in which we were staying, having been sent to me from Caesarea or Caesarea. The Spirit told me to go with them without misgivings. These six brethren also went with me and we entered the man's house. And he reported to us how he had seen the angel standing in his house, saying, Send to Joppa and have Simon, who is called Peter, brought here. And he will speak words to you by which you will be saved, you and your household. And as they began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as he did upon us at the beginning. And I remember the word of the Lord, how he used to say, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Therefore, if God gave to them the same gift as he gave to us also after believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? When they heard this, they quieted them down and glorified they quieted down and glorified God, saying, Well then, God has granted to the Gentiles also repentance that leads to life. Now we've covered many aspects of this text in our Bible study with the questions that have been posed. And some of those questions I may not have an opportunity to answer in my sermon today. The title of my sermon this morning is very simply, Peter's Apologia. And if you've been following our sermon series, you will recognize the word apologia. And the word apologetics is where we get the word apologetics from. And we studied that a few months ago. But before we get into that, before we understand Peter's Apologia, before we begin to understand Peter's defense, before we get stuck into the crucial elements of Acts chapter 11, let's take some time to set the scene, to refresh our minds as to the events leading up to Acts chapter 11. In Acts chapter 9, we saw how the focus moved from Peter to Saul. You remember we studied and we learned how God saved Saul and planned to use him for the preaching of the gospel to the Gentile world. Now, there are many wonderful lessons we learned there concerning Saul's conversion. I think we took that conversion into five different sermons. So there were many wonderful lessons we learned there, and I'm not going to go into that this morning. At the end of Acts 9 and in Acts 10, the focus turns back to Peter. We see how God used Peter in performing those miracles um, and, and importantly, in Acts chapter, so in Acts chapter 10, 
how his own prejudice, Peter's own prejudice about the Gentiles was dealt with through the vision uh, that God gave him. And he was given direction to preach to Cornelius, a Gentile, that God had already prepared to receive the gospel. Chapter 11 begins or brings us to a very, very crucial point in our understanding of the book of Acts, in our understanding of God's plan, of, in our understanding of how God planned that the gospel would reach the outermost parts of the world. Remember, we covered Acts chapter 1, verse 18. What does Acts chapter 1, verse 18 say? Remember it? You've meditated upon it. What does it say? But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Remember that? But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Right up until... Uh, this chapter we've seen, uh, chapter 11, we've seen the gospel preached in Jerusalem and in Judea, correct? We saw in the previous uh, chapters how the gospel had reached Samaria and the Samaritan people were saved. Samaritans got saved. So Jerusalem was reached. Judea was reached. Samaria was reached. Now we come to that aspect of Acts chapter 1 verse 18. The outermost parts of the earth, to the ends of the earth. And this is where Cornelius and his household come into the picture. Sorry, 1-8. Thank you. This is God's plan to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. That a Gentile man called Cornelius, was it, did I say 18? Sorry. <laughs> this was God's plan to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. That a Gentile man called Cornelius would be saved. Him and his household. And through that saving, it will be shown to the rest of the believers, especially the Jewish believers, how the gospel will be preached to the ends of the earth. God used Jewish believers to preach the gospel, and they preached, these Jewish believers preached mainly to the Jews. But now the Gentile believers would also be used for the preaching of the gospel. And we see that plan in Acts chapter 11. If you would progress with me to verse 19. If you will read from verse 19. It says now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over, over Stephen. Traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch. Traveled where? As far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch. Speaking the word of God to no one except who? Jews. Are you with me right now? Verse 20. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and spoke to the Hellenists, or Greeks, if so, your Bible translation might say, also preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord is with them. And a great number who believed turned to the Lord. So we see from verse 20, there was not only the preaching of the gospel now to the Jews, but the preaching of the gospel to the Greeks, to the Gentiles. What we see here is God's redemptive plan. Beloved, you and I are part of that plan. And we are included in Acts chapter 1 verse 8. We're not born Jews. Neither do we live in Jerusalem or Judea or Samaria. We're the Gentiles that are part of God's plan. And God's plan for us we see working through the household of Cornelius, working through Cornelius being saved, working through his household being saved, because through the saving of Cornelius, through the saving of his household, we get the founding of the Gentile church. Are you following me right now? I'm going pretty slow. We get the founding of the Gentile church. So it was the Jewish believers, when we look at the story, and we look at the account with Peter, it was the Jewish believers who had a problem with Peter. Don't, don't misunderstand me. The Jewish believers wanted the gospel 
to be preached, but they wanted the Gentiles who were receiving this gospel, the Gentiles who were claiming salvation now, to first, in a sense, become Jews. Follow Jewish traditions, follow Jewish law in order to be accepted as believers. In their questioning of Peter in Acts chapter 11, verse 1 to 18, they took issue with him preaching to Cornelius. Let me just rephrase that. I think they didn't actually take issue with him preaching to Cornelius. I think they took more issue with him staying with Cornelius and eating with Cornelius. Remember what verse 2 says. Look at verse 2 in Acts chapter 11. So when Peter went to Jerusalem, the circumcision party or the, the circumcised, though they were the Jews, criticized him, took issue with him. Some, some of your Bibles might say contended with him saying, you went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. So their issue really with him wasn't, hey, you went and preached to uncircumcised. You went and preached to the Gentiles. We want to talk to you about that. No, their issue mainly was the fact that he stayed with them and he ate with them. Now, it's important to understand as you read that, it's important to understand that the people who took issue with Peter in Acts chapter 1, so in Acts chapter 11, verse 1 to verse 18, the people who took issue with, people, with Peter were saved people. I want to pause right there for a moment, and I want you to understand this, because this story describes you and I. These were saved people. They, they were church folk, you and I, church folk like you and I, who still had not come to a full understanding of God's redemptive plan. Are you with me right now? They were growing believers. They were still maturing in their faith. And not everything, not everything was clear to them as yet. But they were saved people. That's an important thing to keep in mind. And I submit to you today as I read that and I share with you why this is important for you to understand. There are some things that I still really don't understand as yet. But I'm saved. There are some things that you still don't understand as yet. But you're saved. We're still growing. We're still uh, maturing. God is still teaching us. So we find here, these men contending, taking issue, criticizing Peter because he ate with these Gentiles, he stayed with the Gentile family, and they had an issue with that. But these were saved people who were questioning Peter. So they engaged with Peter about his ministry trip, and Luke uses specific words to adequately describe the scene that uh, Peter walked into. Again, he, he uses the word, they took issue. Or like you heard me say, some Bibles might say, they contended with him. Or your Bible version might say, they criticized him. These are the type of words that is used. So Luke uses those words to help us get the real picture of what Peter faced. And as we look at that, as we look at those words, they took issue with Peter they criticized Peter, they contended with Peter, helps us to see in our mind that Peter really looked like he was in a lot of trouble with these folks. It's like me coming back after a ministry trip and sharing with you something, and you heard that in my ministry trip, I got up to this, 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 this. And here's Peter coming back after his ministry trip. He's probably reporting to the church, or even before he could report to the church, the brethren get together and say, hey, we heard that you ate with these people, you lived with them, what's going on here? The people who asked the question were believers. Again, I make that point. But then notice something. Notice the response. Notice how Peter responds to them. Peter did not get upset with them taking issue with him. I mean, taking issue, contending, criticizing. Those are things to provoke you. Correct? But Peter did not, Peter did not get upset with them. 
And we must make note of Peter's attitude here. His attitude here. His attitude in the way he receives the questioning and in the way he responds. He did not get upset. He did not get angry. He did not take the position of self-elevation. So in other words, hey, listen, who are you to question me? I am Peter. Do you guys know who I am? I preached the first sermon. Thousands got saved. I'm the guy that's going around preaching. So he did not take that self-elevated position of saying, I am Peter, I know better, God is using me, who are you to question me? He did not take that position, but instead he humbly submitted to their questioning and set out very carefully to give them a reason why he did what he did. In fact, in the, in the English Standard Version, it says this, and Peter began speaking and proceeded to explain to them in orderly sequence. Peter began speaking and explaining in orderly sequence. So Peter's response to them was a defense, was his apologetic, was his apologia. Does Peter's response remind you of any scripture you've learned in the last few months? It should. It should. It should remind you of 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. What does it say? Let's go there. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. If you would put a bookmark on Acts 11 and go to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, what does it say? Are you there? 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to give a defense. If you've been writing in your Bible, underlining in your Bible, you would have got the word already, the word defense, apologia in the Greek. To give an apologia, a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. Sound familiar? It should. Thank you. It should sound familiar. We covered this a few months ago. In which sermon? In Stephen's sermon. Stephen's response to the accusation that he was blaspheming God. You remember that? How Stephen set out to accurately give an account, even historically, about who God is. Starting with Abraham and going all the way to Jesus Christ. So 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 says, But in your hearts honor Christ, the Lord is holy, always being prepared to give a defense and apologia to anyone who asks you for the reason, for the hope that is in you. Yet, do it with gentleness and respect. Here's Peter's approach. I'm going to give you a defense, but I'm going to do it with gentleness and respect. I think Peter was humble in his response. Humble in his response. And here's why I think Peter was humble in his response. And this is why this speaks to me so much. And I'm careful in the way I, in, in the way I approach people and the way I talk to them. So listen to this. Maybe it will help teach you something here today. Are you ready? Peter was humble in his response because I think God humbled him. How did God humble him? God humbled him by showing him how wrong he was in his understanding. At first, Peter, like the men who are questioning him, Peter was of the belief that there was truly, there truly needs to be a separation between the Jews and the Gentiles. Are you with me right now? So that's Peter's understanding. Remember, remember, Peter is saved. He's saved. But in his mind, there's still this prejudice that there has to be a separation between the Jews and the Gentiles. That it was, he was forbidden to eat certain fruits, uh, foods. But in the vision that God gave him, in the trance that he was put into, he was shown God's plan. God showed him the plan. And from, the, from, the moment, from that moment on, Peter's thinking and his belief was brought in line with God's plan. From that moment on, Peter's thinking and belief, like you heard me say, was brought in line with God's plan. So even though Peter preached and thousands got saved, though he openly confessed before the Sanhedrin that we'd rather obey God than obey man, Yet, he was still a man being shaped and fashioned 
into the likeness of God. Yet he was still a man who was still the clay and God was the potter. Does that help you today? So Peter's humbled. And he now approached to people. We must take that, that attitude, that humble attitude. For we too did not have all the answers. But now we're getting the answers. And so when we consider those people, when we consider engaging with those people who don't have all the answers, we don't begin our response with this elevated position of us knowing everything and so we talk down to them in a way. No. We must understand that God humbled us by showing us how wrong we were. He began to teach us His ways. And now as we engage, as we give a defense, as we preach the gospel, we take that humble position. Let us also take note that the trance or the vision that Peter um, had and, oh, is, or oh, he was put into is not the pattern, it's not the foundation for people to justify why they have these so-called visions today. I know I'm not preaching to a Pentecostal crowd today, nor a charismatic crowd today. I'm not, I know I'm not preaching to a word of faith, full gospel type of crowd today. For in those types of environments, you have people who tell you they have these visions of God. God put them into this vision or into the so-called trance. These things happen even within a corporate service environment where people will say God told them these things in a vision or God spoke to them in a vision. And they will probably quote the example of Peter having a vision. That's why they can have these visions. Beloved. Visions was how God spoke to the prophets. It was one of the ways God communicated to the people through the prophets what God wanted to say. God gave the prophets vision, the message that he needed to get to his people. Today, we don't need to hear someone say that God spoke to them in a vision. Why don't we need to hear that? Why? The answer is simple. Well, because God has chosen not to speak that way. Instead, He has spoken already in the Word of God, in the Bible. Amen. So today we don't need somebody with a vision telling us that God said to us, Spirit of Life Church, this is what you need to do. No, we've read it, we've studied it, we know what we need to do. Hear the call of the kingdom. You sung it, and you proclaimed your promise to go out and to do it. We don't need a wish, we don't need somebody to come in here and tell us, oh, God told me in a vision that we need to reach our city, we need to reach the lost. No, you already know what you need to do. God has already told you what you need to do. Well, there are these people now become clever. And I contend with a lot of them and debate with a lot of them. Social media and through other ways, even on my ministry trip to South Africa. Well, God still gives me visions as long as the vision is in line with the word. Really? Well, if, you, if your vision is in line with the word, why do you need a vision anyway? Just read the word. <laughs> really? You want me to explain that again? When somebody says to you they have a vision, as long as the vision is in line with the word, say to them, why does God need to give you a vision when the word has already been given? So in other words, I, somebody tells you in a vision, God has told me that in the book of Matthew, uh, so no, God has told me to tell you that we need to reach the lost. How do you know it's from God? Well, that corresponds with, with, the, with the great commission in the book of Matthew. It's just nonsense. It's silly. All we need to do is read the Bible. Read what God has written to our hearts. Amen. The Old Testament and the New Testament. So today we don't need to be put into a trance. We don't need to have all those visions. We don't need to listen to those people. All we need to do is read and study the Word of God. These are His holy instructions to the church. 
So Peter went from prejudice thinking into understanding God's redemptive, redemptive, redemptive plan when God spoke to him in that vision. Really what you see then, what you see with Peter is this, is this, is, for example, you could look at this illustration as Peter. This is the, this is the vision coming down to Peter. Peter sees it, understands it, and the vision is taken back up again. This is the word of God coming to you today. As you read the Bible, as you study the Bible, this is God talking to you through the word, through his holy scripture, through his instruction, telling you what you need to do. So Peter went from prejudice thinking into understanding God's redemptive plan when God spoke to him in the vision. So today we understand, like I said, you understand what Jesus Christ is saying to us, what he's saying to his church. Uh, when we read his word, when we meditate upon his word, when we study his word, when we spend time in his word, church, when we spend time in his word, we get to know what God is saying to us. There's so many people, you, if I could only know the will of God for my life. Yes. Read the Bible. If I could only know what God wants me to do, if I could only know what God wants me, as a husband, as a father, all those questions, as a believer, as a church, all those questions are answered. We get to know the will of God. We get to know God's plan. Like I said, for our individual lives, for our marriage, for our children, for our church. And what I'm teaching you today is nothing new. We're just refreshing our minds. We've covered this in detail in the past. If you're new to our church, and some of the things that I've mentioned today are of particular importance to you, you still, you still don't understand, then please, by all means, question us. Talk with us. Talk with me, talk with Elder Bernard, talk with the deacons. And we'll be more than happy to spend time with you and to explain to you how we came to the conclusions we've come to. So according to Acts 11, God's will was that the world was to receive the gospel. The Gentile world was a part of God's redemptive plan. God's plan was to save the Gentiles, and we see that in the account of Cornelius, the saving of Cornelius and his household. And verse 18 wonderfully sums that up for us. If you look at verse 18 of Acts chapter 11, look at verse 18 with me very quickly. And when they heard these things, when they heard Peter's defense, when they heard these things, they fell silent. And they glorified God saying, then to the Gentiles also, God has granted repentance that leads to life. To the Gentiles also, God has granted repentance that leads to life. So hold, hold on. It's not just as Jews. It's also granted to the Gentiles repentance that leads to life. Are you understanding so far? In other words, we didn't know previously. But now, Peter, now that you took the time to explain it to us, we now see that the Gentiles also, uh, God has granted repentance that leads to life. So what's our lesson here? We see that making a defense is important. Apologetics is important. As a, as a witness, not just to unbelievers, but to believers. So we're not just to give a defense to the people who are unbelievers. We're also, we also need to be prepared to give a defense to believers. Look with me again at 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. First Peter chapter 3, verse 15. But in your hearts, honor Christ as Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. What does it say, church? Who is to give a defense? To who are we to give a defense? And, to, and when are we to give a defense? Can you meditate on that for a few moments? Here's a question. Who is to give a defense? To who are we to give a defense? And when are we to give a defense? 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 makes it clear that we are to give a defense. Who is we? You are to give a defense. Who is you? You're the believer. You're the church. You're the ones who are saved. Are to give a defense 
To who? To anyone. And anyone could be believer or unbeliever. To anyone who asks you for the reason, for the hope that is in you. And when are we to give it? Whenever we're asked. Whenever we're asked. Beloved, we must learn from this that apologetics or giving a defense is not meant only for special Christians. And by special, I mean those clever Christians or those debating Christians. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 says again this, But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you. It doesn't say to anyone who only asks pastor, to anyone who only asks elder B, the only one to, to anyone who only was, asks brother Adrian, to anyone who only asks Rabbi Zachariah, to anyone who only asks John MacArthur or John Piper or all these kind of people. No, it says to anyone who asks you for the reason that, the, that you have that hope. Are you getting me right now? And Children and young people, you are not excluded from this. Oh no, my parents will answer. Andrew was telling me about a story. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to share school stuff. It's a confidentiality clause. Andrew was telling me, so Andrea teaches RE, and she was sharing with me how a child in a parent-teacher meeting, correct, was able to talk about who Christ is, and what sin is. Much to the amazement even probably of the parents. To such a point where Andrea wanted to maybe ask and find out, actually, which church do you go to? Because that's a really good answer that you, that you gave. It's a solid answer that you gave. So young people, children, you're not excluded from this. You have to give a defense, an apologetic. You have to give an answer, a reason for the hope that is in you. So like I said, anyone here could be anybody. It could be even a fellow believer. It could be somebody within our church. It could be somebody from another church. In Acts chapter 11, verse 1 to verse 18, Peter gave a reason to believers. He gave a response to believers. He gave a defense to believers. So we need to change our mindset. We need to see that God's plan is for us also to engage with and reason with and give a defense even to those who are already saved. Don't think that because somebody carries a Bible, don't think that because somebody is going to church, don't think that because they have a picture of a fish on the back of their car that they know all the answers. So we don't leave the giving of a defense to these special forces Christians. We must get it out of our mindset. You know, whenever somebody asks a question, Brother Adrian, Elder B, and myself are not going to abseil into your situation with music playing in the background like we are the answers to the question. We're going to answer that question for you. No, you got to answer it. You have got to answer. And we want to, that's why we're here. That's why we have Bible study. To train you, to teach you, to give that answer. And if you've been doing that, then praise God. Amen. Praise God. You're learning. You're growing. And if you're not, I pray the message will convict your heart. That you will start to learn to give a defense. I want to very quickly, very quickly, um, give you a few reasons why we need to really, really consider if you haven't already understood why you need to give a defense, why you need to understand the reason why apologetics is so important. Maybe those few reasons will help you. Number one, firstly, because God commanded it. I, do you want to disobey God? No, certainly not. I'm, I'm sitting in with a group of people today. We're talking to a church that I know in your hearts you don't want to disobey God. You want to worship God. You want to please Him. You want to do what's right before Him. You want to do what's pleasing to Him. And doing what's pleasing to Him is, means obeying His Word. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 is not an option for you to tick. Um, I don't think I'll do this today. I'll let it go. This is not for me. I'll let it go. 
No, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 is a command to us all. Every believer. So the first and most obvious reason is that we're commanded to defend our faith. Second, do you know what apologetics helps you to know what you know and what you don't know? The more you talk with people about what those people don't understand, the more you realize what you need to learn and understand. There's nothing like somebody asking you a question to make you realize how much you know and how much you don't know. And beloved, as, as, and, and don't be scared of that. Don't, don't think, oh, that's the reason why I shouldn't do it, Pastor, because they're gonna really, I'm going to really find out that I don't know much. Good! Good! The more you realize how much you don't know, the more you want to learn more. Somebody's you know, confronting you with a question and you stumbling over it is not the end of the world. It really means this. Hey, that's a good question. I'm going to come back to you with an answer. Give me a day or two. I can't answer that right now, but I promise you I'm going to get back to you. I promise you I'm going to come back and answer that question. And there are other things that you can just offer. It just flows from you and you can just answer it. And that happens with me as well. There are some things that I'm just very fluent in. And there are some things I stumble over. Because God is still working on those things in my life. And so it'll be with you. There are things that you can just easily talk about, easily defend, easily answer. And some of the things that you are still not sure about and you're still learning. And there's nothing wrong with that. So the second reason we need apologetics is because it helps us know our own faith. And I revisit this with you again today, church. I'll revisit this with you again. With these words, do we really understand what the Trinity is? Do we really understand the difference between the two natures of Christ? Do we really understand the physical resurrection? Do we really understand the difference between justification, sanctification? Are those words foreign to us? Do we really under understand what it means to be saved? What it means to be born again? Sadly, there are many Christians who don't know what those things mean. Is it important to know what they mean? Sure it does. Because that, that helps you to understand who you are in Christ. What Christ has done for you. And it helps you understand then how to preach the gospel. It's important. So the more we make a defense of the gospel, the more we are personally sharpened in our knowledge and relationship with God. Maybe number three, we need apologetics because we need to counter the bad image. The bad image that Christianity has received in the media and in culture. Tele-evangelists, we've come across them. Tele-evangelists and their scandals, both sexually, monetarily. Those things that are a disgrace to Christianity. And the Catholic Church hasn't helped with its scandals involving priests. And on, on top of all of this, the media, you know, is biased against Christianity. You see all these negative opinions being promoted everywhere about Christianity. Maybe another reason, I'll, and I'll close with this. I, I have about eight reasons, and I'll give you just this one more, and I'll close. Another reason why we need to address, why we need to focus on apologetics, why you need to talk to people in other churches, why... You need to look at casting your net even into people who go to churches. It's because there are many, many false teachings around. Apologetics helps us to address those false teachings. So I'll close with this. So we were in Cape Town and the last Sunday that we were there, we didn't go to a church. So at the breakfast um, area of the hotel. There were these group of people who had gathered a few days earlier. And it had come to my attention that they were there on some sort of conference. So these were people from a particular tribe of northern South Africa uh, whose language I don't particularly understand. Um, so they were there, probably in the hundreds, and some people were at this hotel. And so I decided to leave Sister Jay on her own 
take my bacon and eggs, go across to these people, sit down and talk to them about why they were in Cape Town. So I ended up talking to them and said to them, hello, good morning, my name is so-and-so, hello, how are you? So uh, they were very, uh, whoa, what are you doing right now? We don't do this. You know, so I sat down, spoke to them, introduced myself and said, okay, uh, I heard that you were here for a conference. Can you tell me what the theme of the conference is? Uh, they spoke to one another in their own language and then told me, you know, there's no theme of a conference. They are there to climb Mount Zion. I said, that's interesting. I've been to Cape Town. This is my third visit. I was went, uh, well, I went when I was 18 months old. I can't remember that one. I went when I was 11 years old. I remember that one. And I went two weeks ago. In all my time there, I don't remember a Mount Zion. There's a table mountain. There's a lion's head. There's, uh, there's a peak on the other side. There's all these wonderful views from mountaintops. But I've never come across a Mount Zion. So I was curious. I said, tell me more. They said, twice a year, they come to Cape Town to climb Mount Zion. I said, really? I said, Mount Zion, is that a physical place? They said, yes, it's a physical place. I said, wow. Tell me more. They said there are three million of them. And they follow this man who in 1960 something, God has spoken to him and told him that he was the Holy Spirit. And that God had told him that if anyone confessed their sins to him, that he could forgive their sins. And if anybody wants healing, he could heal them. Brethren, I'm talking about people who are well-dressed. They look well-educated. They look like they have money. They look like they're the elite of society. But yet they believe that there is a physical Mount Zion that they have to climb twice a year, and that there is a man that they could confess their sins to, that he was able to forgive them of their sins. And the most absurd thing of all is that he is the Holy Spirit. And then they asked me a question. I said, really? And I began to engage with them. They said to me, so uh, th with other things which are really, really will surprise you. Is this, they said to me, you see all these people here? Nothing can hurt them. I said, well, really? Why? They said, you know, in South Africa, we have all these shootings. And I said, yeah, that's bad. They said, if you shoot them, they will not die. I said, oh, really? They said, you know, we have witchcraft here. I said, yeah, and I know it's true. They said, no witchcraft can affect them. I said, really? Tell me more. And why? Because they're gods. I said, really, they're gods? I said, yes, because we are made in the image of God. So we are gods. And this heresy and false teaching was growing one on top of the other on top of the other and then i said to him um so he says uh, i said really you, you uh, uh, god is human i said yeah jesus christ was human so so god is human oh man where do you begin with these people where do you begin and so i took them to john 4 that says god is spirit and they kept quiet I said, in all, I said, in all that you told me, you haven't quoted a single scripture. And I'm just giving you one scripture right now. John 4, I can give you many others. But I give you one scripture right now. It says, God is spirit. Oh, no, no, no. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Was Jesus Christ human? <laughs> and it went back to the same thing that Jesus Christ walked the face of the earth, that he came in a physical body, that he was not a spirit. That he was, and they kept going back to that. It led me to believe that they did not understand the nature of Christ. The natures of Christ. It did not understand who Christ is. Eventually, I said to them, brothers, in the, in the, in the sense, not, they were, not, not that they were Christian brothers, but brothers as in, brothers in mankind, brothers from the same country, brothers, I said to them, you need to read your Bible. And the guy who was the chief uh, uh, spokesman for these people said, uh, well, I don't know my Bible, but I am the Bible. I said, oh. <laughs> so as they got up in anger, now, they, now they're angry. Now they're angry. And these are loud African men. And they got up angry from the breakfast table. And I'm still sitting calm. And Sister Jay is listening from the back. But now everyone in, in, the, in the restaurant dining room is all listening to us. And then they got up and they started to talk again in their own language. In the language I don't understand. And they began to mock me. They began to laugh at me. I know, I know they're talking about me. They're mocking me and laughing. And the day later, we were back again, Monday morning, before we went to the airport. Again, they were back there. And they were mocking, talking about me, the silly man who doesn't know that God is human and doesn't know that we're all gods. 
brethren, there are false teachings out there. I use the opportunity to preach the gospel to them. Use the opportunity to, to draw them to genuine faith in Christ. Do the opportunity to bring them to the saving knowledge of who Jesus Christ is. I've given you the shortened version of the whole event. Of the whole event. So we must understand that there are false teachings and we must be able to give a defense for our faith. And I'll close with this. I thought we were finishing early. I'll close with this. In the book of Jude, our brother Tian did an excellent job when he was here. It speaks about us contending for the faith. We are to contend for the faith. And that word contend is important. I want you to go and read it in, in verse 3 of Jude. Verse 1 to verse 3. And focusing on verse 3. I don't have time right now, but it's, it, it's almost you know, silly to say I, it's important, but I don't have time to talk about it. The word contend is an important word there. And it's, it, it suggests a serious wrestling with someone about something that is important, about our faith. It suggests waging a war, but a close contact war, a close contact wrestling. Now, if we're going to do that, if we're going to be in close contact, we can't avoid being confrontational. And that is where most of us will back away. We hate being confrontational. We hate confronting somebody. As one pastor says, Christians have adopted an 11th commandment. And the 11th commandment is, thou shalt be nice. They seek, no, they strive, no, they motivate themselves to obey the 11th commandment and they forget one's, you know, commandments 1 to 10. Let's just focus on the 11th one, thou shalt be nice. Why? Because we hate being confrontational. But we have to confront these things. We have to be able to contend closely for the faith. And that is why I think Paul says in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation. The fact that Christianity is under attack in the world is the reason why we need to fight the good fight. Without shrinking back. We need to give a good defense, a rational defense, an intelligent defense. We have, to, we have to give relevant explanations. I pray you heard me this morning. Let us pray.